Today on this third month, 15th day of 2020, we're going to talk about unleashing the power of prayer into your life. One thing is to pray, another thing is to unleash a prayer. I heard a story about a Baptist church that was against a new bar that was being built in their town. So they had an all-night prayer or a prayer of thine to pray for this bar to be gone. Not long after the prayer meeting broke up, the bar was struck by lightning and it burned to the ground. It was consumed by fire. There was nothing left. The bar owner was extremely upset and furious, so he filed a lawsuit against the church. He claimed the church was responsible because of their prayers against him. So the church hired an attorney claiming they had no responsibility whatsoever for the destruction of this bar. The judge presiding over the case said, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but one thing is clear. The bar owner believes in the power of prayer, but the church does not. Amen? And that's a true story. <laughs> prayer is the key that unlocks all doors. Our prayers may be a little awkward at times, and they do seem kind of difficult to get out. Uh, sometimes they may, you may think their attempts are feeble and unheard, and nobody's listening. But our prayers' power are in the one who hears them, not the one who says them. You need to remember that. So when you're thinking your prayer's not good enough, it's not about it's not good enough. It's about the one that hears them is good enough. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus says, you don't have enough faith. Jesus told him, truly I tell you, if you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Most people concentrate on the mustard seed in the mountain, correct? That's what you think about it. But what Jesus wants us to concentrate on is the last sentence of the verse. Jesus said, nothing will be impossible for you. That's what he wants you concentrating on. Last Sunday, we, le we learned to even thank God for our problems. We talked about a, a couple of ladies, Corey Tindley and her sister Betsy. They were in Ravensbrook concentration camp because of their family was hiding Jews. And during World War II, and we talked about the fleas. Remember the fleas? were a horrible flea infestation. And Betsy told Corey, we need to thank God for these fleas. Her sister did. Corey said, I am not thanking God for no fleas. But she was finally convinced by Betsy, her sister, and she did. And we also remember that the only barracks that wasn't harassed of all Ravensbrook, there's hundreds of barracks, was their barracks because the guards didn't like the fleas. You see that? So they could pray, have Bible study, they were pretty much left alone. So that's pretty amazing how God can even use a flea. we got to thank God for a promise. One thing I want to tell you is that Betsy did not survive Ravensbrook. Corey's parents did not survive Ravensbrook concentration camp. Corey's the only one that did survive and uh, she did, when she got out of there, she eventually moved to California, wrote many books, used to tour around the country. And I recommend you Google Corey Tindrum and listen to this great woman of faith because she's got something to tell you even though she's not here anymore. Her word is still alive. The Word of God says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yes, he did say in every situation, even the bad ones. Thank him for them too. Because you just don't know if those bad ones are actually good ones. You can't see what he sees or know what he knows. When we pray, we must always remember that God 
is the power of our prayer. Now let's talk about Elijah. I'm going to read uh, 1 Kings 18.32. It says, and he's talking about Jezebel and the, God, the uh, false gods of Baal, how he was sent to, to lead the Israelites away from them. Because they were all, God was upset because they were all turned into Baal, which was nothing, nobody. So it says here in 1 Kings 18.32, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two shays of seed. Uh, two shays is about three gallons. If we were to read chapter 18, 1 Kings, we would read about how the prophet of Baal were sincere in their beliefs. They were very sincere, the prophets were. But they were also sincerely wrong. Sincerity is not the key to being right. We think that it is, but it is not. You have to be sure that your faith is in the right source. That's what the key to being right is. God was sick of his people getting misled to worship this ball by Jezebel and her priest. We know the story of Jezebel. So to show everyone the truth, he sent Elijah to propose a contest on top of Mount Carmel. Under God's guidance, Elijah told Ahab, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal and the Israelites, they should have a contest between God and Baal. The people were delighted to have the contest. The rules to this contest were pretty simple and basic. Each would cut up an ox, and then they would put it on their altar to their God. Then Elijah said to Baal's prophets, Call the name of your God, and I will call the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Said it once and for all. All the people agreed that this was a great idea. The bold prophets hooped and hollered, calling on the name from morning until noon, saying, Oh, mighty ball, answer us, mighty ball. Not a word come out of him, because there wasn't no mighty ball. The Bible says they leaped about the altar, which they made. They put on quite the show. But of course, nobody answered because Ball was a false fake that only lived in their imagination. The Word of God says that they raved like fools until the evening sacrifice, like a bunch of idiots. But there was no answer, no voice. They were believing in the wrong thing. Then it was Elijah's turn. The first thing Elijah did was to repair the altar of the Lord that had been damaged by the prophets of Baal. Now, he didn't use that altar. He built a new altar. He said, then he built an altar in the name of the Lord and dug a trench around it. Why did Elijah dig a trench around the Lord's altar? Elijah wanted to make it different, as difficult as possible so that when God sent the fire, there'd be no doubt that it come from God. We see a prelude to a to powerful praying by Elijah here. We see a righteous person praying to overcome an impossible situation, don't we? The Word of God says in James 5.16, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And we see that Elijah was a righteous person, wasn't he? And it was a very earnest prayer. Now, mind you that Baal had 450 prophets and Elijah was by himself, just one. So the prophets of Baal continued cutting themselves and yelling and jumping around until evening. And it was time to light the fires at their altars to burn the sacrifice of their oxes to their gods, right? Our God and Baal. We read out of the Bible. We're going to read out of the Bible. Uh, 1 Kings 18, or remember, it's going to be on the board, 18, 30 through 39. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each tribe of Israel, and used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, 
cut the bowl into pieces and lay the pieces on the wood. Then he says, fill four large jars of water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, bull and wood and stones and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. <coughs> what we see here is not just that He prayed. He unleashed his prayer to God. Do you see that? Show them that you are God. Show them that you sent me. Show them who you are. And guess what? So can you. Do you have any needs in your life that, that you need to unleash prayer to God for? Something that's, you know, one thing's to pray, another thing's to unleash prayer. Something's when you unleash something, it's like unleashing a mad dog. You know, he's coming, right? Nothing's going to stop him. He's got one focus, and that's to get to what he's unleashed to. Sometimes we get so caught up in damage control that, that we forget to give the control over to God. Right? Sometimes we just need to abide in the power and prayer and be still with God. In other words, be quiet. Don't walk around complaining about the same thing you done gave away to God. And then sometimes we just need to unleash prayer to the problem. This is a true story. Shortly after the Dallas Theological Seminary was founded in 1924, it almost came to the point of bankruptcy. All the creditors were going to foreclose at noon on a particular day. That morning they met in the president's office with Dr. Schaefer for prayer that God would provide a way for them. In the prayer meeting was a man by the name of Dr. Harry Ironside. Sounded like a pretty serious prayer, didn't it? When it was his turn to pray, he prayed in his normal, characteristic manner. Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and send us the money. While they were praying, a tall Texan with boots came in with an open collar. Why they open collar, I don't know. Anyway, it's a story I just wrote down here. And he stepped up to the business office and said, I just sold two train loads of cattle in Fort Worth. But I've been trying to make a business deal here, but it fell through. And I feel compelled to give the money to this seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check that he left. The secretary took the check, knowing how critical things were financially, went to the door of the prayer meeting, and timidly knocked. When she finally got a response, Dr. Schaefer took the check out of her hand. It was exactly the amount of the debt. When he looked at the name, he recognized the cattleman's name of Fort Worth. And turning to Dr. Ironside, he said, God sold the cattle and sent us the money. Amen? Just like Elijah did with the prophets of Baal, Dr. Ironside did with the other ministers and ministers against the debt at the Dallas Seminary, didn't he? This is how you can unleash your prayer into your problems. And this is how you unleash the power of prayer into your life. In Hebrews 4.16 it says, Let us therefore go boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What I see that the secret here is go boldly to the throne of grace. Dr. Ironside went boldly. 
We know you're, you're kind of a thousand, you have the cattle on a thousand hills. Go sell them and send us some money. Don't go boldly to the throne of grace and then start working on plan B just in case, which is most likely what usually happens. Elijah didn't take a can of gasoline and a lighter with him just in case. Elijah took gallons of water with him just in case. The people thought it wasn't God who did it. He, his plan B was to bring honor to God, not himself. Do you see that? And this is what our only plan B should be as well. If you don't need God's help, don't ask him for it. If you're going to do it yourself, don't waste your time. Because you're already going to plan B and you're, you're canceling the prayer you unleashed. It's no longer an unleashed prayer. It's just some mumble jumble. If you do need God's help, be bold and leave it with him. Don't take gasoline to start a fire. Take water. So go boldly to the throne of grace and leave it there. And this is how we unleash our prayers into our problems. And we all have problems that need prayers unleashed into them. We all have loved ones that we're very concerned about. We all have ourselves sometimes that we're concerned about. Our finances, our, our addictions, any, any situation in our life that it could be. But we need to unleash our prayer and we give it to God. We need to keep it with God. When you hear, oh, I don't know, you, you've already prayed for, for God to heal your son or for someone else or your daughter, anybody, a friend, yourself, from an addiction, let's use that for an example. And someone comes up to you and says, yeah, Bobby, I just don't think he's going to make it. Don't agree with them. Say, no, he's going to make it because God already gave it to God. He's going to heal him. Start claiming this victory. Uh, all this time, Elijah, he brought water to start a fire. How many people bring water to start a fire? Someone who loves God enough to believe that God can overcome that water to start that fire. Don't bring gasoline. Because when you bring when you bring plan B in the plan, you're bringing your gasoline. You're not, God's not doing nothing. You've already eliminated him. So any plan he had is God. He can't, you've already pushed him out of the way. And you've already taken over and chose yourself as God. And you're not. I know some of you probably, some people probably think they are God. I've met a few of them. But, uh, but they're not. You have to stand up and put what you believe in God in the forefront of any other things that you have. And God will prevail. I remember when uh, Pastor Dot's grandma was on hospice. And I asked her, she said, would you pray for my grandma? I'm like, you know, hospice is, you know, we already know what that is. That's the end. I said, what do you want us for me to pray for? She goes, you must have sure. Like something's wrong with her. For her to get better. <laughs> for her to be healed. I said, okay, let's do it. Jesus, heal her. That evening she got up and started cooking dinner. That's, that's the truth. You know, God can do anything. But we need to be like Pastor Dot. What do you want, Pastor Dot? I'm looking for wavering faith. She's over here to, to heal her. Never forget that. Amen? So we need to have, we need to have Elijah face. We need to unleash it. And when you unleash it, don't try to bring it back. If you try to take a bad dog back that's your dog to unleash on something, you might get bit trying to get him back. You might be the only one that gets bit. He may not even know he bit you, but he's going to bite something. You see, so be careful what you do. Don't, don't try to, to be two-faced with God, I guess you could say. Give it to God and let God have it. That's unleashing the power of prayer, and you have that ability in you to take care of these things. Sometimes we have infirmities that maybe we need to have. You understand that? Maybe we need to have that. We don't know what God's plan. We need to be thankful for whatever God gives us, whatever it is. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we come to you right now. We thank you for this, this privilege and opportunity it is to worship together again, Father God. We pray for all these people in here. We thank you for these folks, Father God. And we thank you that the Lamb's blood has been, has been poured over everybody here, every post in here, every person in here, Father God, and that, and that they, will, they will continue to be healthy, Father God. And we thank you for that. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for our families. And we pray for those out there, Father God. We pray for our country, Father God, as things are really getting stirred up right now, Father God. 
And we thank you so much for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.